Hey, how's it going? Welcome to episode 3. Today's first question comes from Neil Guy. Mark, great info. I'm moving back to Edinburgh to play as a gym after living in Australia for a couple of years. Over here I've been competing with an affiliate of the WFPA. I was wondering if it was possible for you to give me a quick summary of powerlifting and scene and federations in Scotland and the UK. Thanks. Hey Neil, excellent choice of gym. We've got a few lifters at the Pleasants currently, and if you haven't been back since we've had the extension put on, you're in for a wonderful surprise. We've got loads of new freeways, so that'll be a good surprise for you if you've not seen it. Um, currently in Scotland and the UK, your options are British Drug Free Power of the Federation, BDPFA, an affiliate of the WPFA, and as you'll know, they offer both equipped and unequipped tested lifting, and are pretty well subscribed to in the UK. The comps are also fairly well attended in Scotland. It's probably the best attended federation in Scotland, but probably not the UK. Next federation is the Great British <coughs> Power of the Federation. They are, they are the British affiliate of the IPF, and similar to the BDPFA, offer a range of equipped and unequipped lifting. Um, this federation, this is the federation I personally compete with, and uh, they're also the most popular within the UK, but probably not in Scotland. Um, they are my preference primarily just because of the standard of international competition, and it's the IPF, so um, it's probably the best federation for untested or for tested lifting. Um, Next, the BPO, or the British Powerlifting Organisation, <coughs> offer both unequipped and again equipped lifting in the UK for all tested lifters. If you want to lift the rules set, similar to the IPF, as in single ply suits, etc., this is the all tested federation in the UK you should go for. Um, the British Powerlifting Congress offer both unequipped and multi ply equipped lifting in the UK for the all tested lifter. They are, they are an affiliate of the World Powerlifting Congress. They also offer a pretty well subscribed to a decent standard of unequipped international competition. So if you're an untested raw lifter, this is probably the federation you're looking to go with in the UK. And there are also a number of smaller federation affiliates, but for the sake of brevity, I'll, I'll save you going over them. Um, I'll leave the links to these federations in the description for anyone who's looking for more information. Um, if you want to compete tested in the UK, the two options you're looking at are BDPFA and GDPF. You can compete nationally with both federations, but internationally you have to choose one or the other. <coughs> so that depends on your preferences. Hope that answered your question. Um, next question comes from Philip Waterfield. Supplements, in particular, should they be any different from bodybuilders for weightlifting and powerlifting? Bidalanine, creatine and caffeine. And your thoughts on pre-workout supplements? Thoughts on hypertrophy incorporated into a weightlifting program? Also for powerlifting. Cheers. Um, so, just on the general topic of supplements for strength and size, they are unfortunately of minimal influence, if any influence at all. Um, just one meta-analysis on the subject. Um, and this was but this was um, written by Stephen L. Neeson. Richard L. Sharp was published in 2002 in the Journal of Applied Physiology, entitled. Effective dietary supplements on lean mass and strength gains with resistance exercise, a meta-analysis. In this paper, they looked at 72 papers in total, and they concluded the following. Of the 250 supplements examined, only 6 had more than 2 studies that met the criteria for inclusion in meta-analysis. Creatine and HMB were found to significantly increase net lean mass gain, 0.36 and 0.28% a week, respectively and strength gains of 1.09% and 1.4% a week, respectively. In conclusion, two supplements, creatine and HMB, have data supporting their use to augment lean mass and strength gains with resistance training. Um, so according to that review, only two supplements have shown any significant effect, an effect of 0.3% and 1.4% for hypertrophy and strength. Um, respectively could probably be lost in experimental noise. So probably not really that powerful. Well certainly not that powerful, maybe not even worth considering. Um the two when I get to that ask asked this question probably, I'll say um you're looking either for protein as a food replacement because meat's expensive or creatine because it has a body of evidence to show that it has a fairly small positive effect 
although you could argue that effect's fairly negligible. So it's your money, it's up to you. Personally, I don't bother with supplements. I just eat food. Uh, it was up to yourself. Um, pre-workout supplements like caffeine are generally a good idea if you're going to be taking part in an intense or long session. But you can definitely oversubscribe to these supplements as you build up a tolerance and end up having to take more and more to have an effect. Um, so you might want to cycle on and off them. So if you're taking like 400 milligrams of caffeine, you maybe want to do it for a period of three weeks of your training intensely for three weeks and maybe take a two week break. It's up to you how you break it up. Uh, I, I take a lot of caffeine, drink a lot of coffee, um, but I like the taste of coffee more than I like caffeine, although I do love caffeine. Um, so again, up to you. Um, as you'll know, recently there was a, s a spite of um, pre-workout supplements that got banned and why and this tends to be the case on anything that has a has a general generally an effect. If something has a physiological effect, it's usually categorized as a drug and controlled as such. So anything that has a super physiological effect normally ends up on the water ban list. And the supplements that are kicking around that aren't on that ban list aren't there because they're ineffective. Effectively. So supplements are pretty much something you can you can forget about, in my opinion, but it's up to you. Um, as regards to hypertrophy for, for weightlifting or powerlifting, hypertrophy is very movement specific. As in, when you bench a squat, the motor units and fibers recruited during that lift will be hypertrophied specifically, with a lessening effect the more peripheral they are in the process. So, if you're doing a flat bench press, the actual fibers that are contracting to finish the bench press will be hypertrophied preferentially. And then the further away the fibers get away from those motor units, the less preferentially they'll be hypertrophied. So hypertrophy is movement specific, effectively. So the best way to create more size and force reduction potential is the use of the skill itself, or biomechanically similar movement to hypertrophy the relevant muscle groups. So for example, on a bench press, you might choose bench press or flat dumbbell press, done for high volume, high hypertrophy the muscles involved in the, in the movement, to augment your... Uh, your training, or your strength training, or your higher percentage training. Um, skill specific hypertrophy for weightlifting is a fairly inane concept, so there's less of a muscular effort and more of a discrete sports skill in the vein of something like a jump or a throw. So things like snatches and cleans and jerks are more of a discrete sports skill than they are an actual movement or a muscular movement like a squat or a bench. Um, there's more finesse in it, so it's a, it's, it, hyper, it doesn't work with Getting better at those skills doesn't work quite in the same way as getting better at a bench or squat works. Um, so what you can do though is hypertrophy and build the strength in fairly general movements like squats, pulls, presses, push presses will build up the general muscles of all the movement. Although it won't actually, it doesn't have a, a direct correlative effect, you actually get better at a cleaner snatch, but it will help strengthen up the muscles. So if you do something like a clean pull, heavier than you can clean and you do it with good form you get progressively stronger at it then in theory it'll strengthen up the first part of your pull which means you can pull more aggressively and not come out of position which may have the knock-on effect that you can clean your snatch more um, but it's more tenuous than in a squat if you do tens and get better at tens when you're squatting then your one arm is going to go up for squat um, fairly close because they have a relationship for that so it's something to be mindful of when you're training hypertrophy for width of them um, as a general rule for hypertrophy and conditioning, I would say choose one or two exercises per area uh, on an area you want to perform and work on and perform those exercises twice a week for high volume. So say for instance you decide that you need to work on your hamstring size and your back size to help your sport. You might perform two exercises, so say you choose leg curl hamstrings, lat pull down for your back and two times a week you perform three to five sets of 8 to 15 reps and just keep them in your program. So this is very much just a dose response. You'd be choosing a fairly low weight, something that will fatigue your muscles within that rep range and you'd be performing upwards of 80 to 100 reps a week of that exercise. And over time that will have an effect on the size of your back. Something I've used for my upper back and lap pull into the room two times a week, five sets of ten. And it had a much bigger hypertrophy effect on my back than do weighted pull-ups, better rows, all the things I did for strength um, that didn't actually have that much of an effect on the size of my back. 
um, I've found in the past that like better form of things like machines or dumbbells leads to more specific hypertrophy in what you're trying to target. So I'd say I'm probably a big believer in keeping your assistance as untaxed as possible so you can save your energy for the sport specific skills themselves, aka your competitive lifts. So if you're part of the squat, bench press and deadlift, you can be fresh for your, more fresher for your training. You stay away from heavy assisted exercise like bent over rows or T bar rows that will have a fatiguing effect on the muscles of your back. They don't have any transfer really to the sport specific skills like deadlifting or squatting. You'd be, you'd be better off spend that energy in your squat training, in your deadlift training, in your bench training, and also for snatch and clean and jerk for weightlifting. You maybe want to pay less attention to things like pulls and squats and pay more attention in your training to the actual skills themselves. You'll, you'll get much better bang for your buck that way. Doesn't mean you should neglect the assistance by any means, but you should always be mindful of what you're training for. If you're training to be a better weightlifter, you have to train your competitive lifts. If you're training to be a better powerlifter, training the discrete skill set themselves will make you a better lifter. Um, but of course you need to do your systems the same as everybody else. Hope that answered your questions. Um, any more questions, just pop them in the comment section below or send me an email to the address provided. Um, I'll put a link to that um, paper in the description as well as the, to the various federations mentioned. And um, This concludes episode 3. Um, hope there's plenty more questions for the next time, and I'll see you then. Bye.